Okay, guys. So I'm going to continue more with this ABC Christian nonsense and uh, talk about the Man of Sin. He's talking about this video that I made, the Man of Sin figurative, where I was uh, still kind of questioning things and just presenting some ideas. And I, I've actually deleted this video now. And uh, that was kind of my idea to delete it in the future anyways. Uh, the main point of the video was to say that, you know, Second Thessalonians chapter 2 is not teaching some future boogeyman antichrist figure individual who, you know, takes over the world and everything. That's, you know, popularly taught. And so, and I wanted to understand it that, you know, the day of Christ is the day, or the, the coming of the Lord, or the day of Christ is, you know, something that happens at death, uh, you know, something that's good for a saint, something that's bad for, um, unbelievers and so i was trying to figure it out in that context and i said that the man of sin i thought maybe it was like the body of sin it's like the old nature that god destroys when he comes or whatever but that doesn't totally make sense so i don't really go with that now uh, that was just you know something that i just suggested just i was trying to get some different interpretations out there um but anyways i'm going to play his video so I'm just, you know, those are some Bible verses to refute that. And then he has the man Refuted of sin nothing. figurative. Like there's no actual man of sin. And I'm going to refute that. So in the video, <laughs> he's saying that the man of sin is figurative. But here at the Bible, it says, we're going to go to verse 3 in Second Thessalonians. Second Thessalonians. Sorry, it's hard for me to pronounce that word. Um, verse uh, uh, Second Thess Thessalonians chapter two verse three. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. So it's talking about a man. So I'm not sure why he thinks it's figurative. The Bible seems pretty clear. Okay, so he questions why I thought the man of sin was figurative. Um, or possibly. That's why, you know, I had the question mark there too. But, and then he says, I'm going to refute that. And again, all he does is read some verses. And then he says, well, there you see it. It has to be a, a man. Okay. So just because the word man is there, it means a physical, literal man? <laughs> oh, man. You know what? So I have this in the Bible study page on the forum where I uh, put together some verses with the word man in it where it's figurative. Like, let's see here, Romans chapter 6, 6, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. So the old man, is that a literal physical man? You know, uh, I don't know, sometimes wives will call their husbands their old man, or, you know, maybe the old man's uh, somebody's father or grandfather. Is that what this means? Knowing this, that our grandfathers are crucified with him. Is that what that means? Physical, literal, old man? Like literally, like elderly, like old age? Or does it mean like our old nature? Is it is it figurative for something? Hmm. The inward man. I delight in the law of God after the inward man. Who's the physical, literal, inward man? <sighs> Uh, okay. Some of these, I don't know, you know, inward man again. Inner man, old man. New man, old man. New man. Then we see man of God. That represents like the saints. And hidden man of the heart. Is that physical and literal? So we can see that sometimes, you know, it's worth questioning these things, whether it's physical or literal or not. Okay. Whether it's figurative. 
Now, the, we talk about the man of God in the Bible. You know, it's talking about, like, saints, children of God, sons of God. And so now I think that the man of sin is, like, the opposite of that. I think the man of sin is, like, sinners, lost sinners. I think possibly what John is, or what Paul is saying in Second Thessalonians chapter 2, he's talking about this day of judgment of God that comes when the body dies, like I said, and um, I think he's talking about like individual sinners being judged. He's talking about that man of sin being revealed, the son of perdition. So it's the judgment upon sinners, but he's saying like, you know, how they're like individually judged. And he's, he's speaking of them as individuals. He just talked about, in 1 Thessalonians 5, he's talking about how those who are in darkness, you know, will face God's wrath at the judgment. They'll be overcome like a thief. And he talks about how, you know, we... We are saved. We will be saved as saints. I think that's kind of like what he's going over again in Second Thessalonians chapter two. Okay. Um, at the end, you know, he talks again. God hath chosen you to salvation. He talks about they who that all they all. They all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. I think that's what he's basically talking about here. You know, when the Lord comes for them, that's when, you know, the sinners are going to be revealed and destroyed. They are the ones who come after Satan. They are, you know, children of Satan. So it's not speaking of one specific individual, you know, boogeyman antichrist in the future or anything. This is just speaking of generally all sinners, all lost people, uh, but he's speaking of them as individuals. Okay. You know, he says, he shall destroy them with, he shall... Destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all powers and signs and lying wonders. Okay. Let's see. He talks about here in... Second Thessalonians chapter 1, The Lord Jesus be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels and flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God. And I think that's the same thing that he's saying in Second Thessalonians chapter 2. The judgment of sinners as a whole, but he's speaking of them individually. Okay. Basically, I hope you'll understand that, but I'll try to explain that better in the future. I think that I'm seeing it maybe a little more clear now. Um, anyways, I guess I'll just end this here. But you can see that the man, you know, the inner, the inner man, the new man, the old man, the hidden man of the heart, there's lots of times when stuff like that's figurative. And so I think man of sin stands for, you know, sinners. Just like son or man of God stands for, you know, children of God. Um, which is kind of interesting too. Let me go back to that verse and look at that. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good work. Second Thessalonians chapter three, verse seventeen, or Second Timothy. Um, 
all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So, see, is this speaking of one specific man of God who is to come, you know, or something like that? No, this is speaking of pretty much every saint, okay? Scripture is useful for every saint. Um so that they may be perfect and thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So I hope you can see maybe that comparison. Right here it says, you know, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, is pro profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God, okay, which means any child of God, may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So I think when we're talking about Second Thessalonians here, we see, uh, then that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. It's just talking about, you know, any sinner, okay, when they die, this is what will happen, you know. And they all oppose and exalt themselves above God, okay. So... That's how I see it now. So, God bless.